Bible with you, I would always encourage you to bring your Bible to church. Um, I know there's many different methods that you can use today. Some will use an iPad, some will use their phone. But there's something just about having a copy, a physical copy of the Bible in front of you. You can take notes, you can underline things. You'll hear me tell you at times to do that. And uh, today what we're going to do is talk about um, a subject that you have probably wondered about before. It may be an odd Easter message to give to you today, but it has to do with the bodily resurrection. And not just Christ, but what happens to you and I when we die. Have you ever wondered about that? We, we say things like, well, our loved one is in heaven, and then we go to the grave and we visit them. It seems like something is, is missing there, or something is confused. And so today we're going to talk just a little bit about that. Would you join me in prayer as we get ready to have the message this morning? Lord, we come to you today and we thank you for this day that you have given to us. Lord, it is always our prayer and our desire that you would be honored and glorified in everything that is said and done. Today, Lord, I thank you for each and every one that is here, that has come together to worship you and to serve you. And Lord, I realize that today, as I stand here and I preach this message, that I stand here as a sinner and I need forgiveness of my sin. So Lord, I ask you to forgive me of the sin that's in my life and just place it beneath the blood of Jesus. Help us to understand better this passage. Help us to apply it to our life. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is no doubt a very interesting passage in the Bible. It's what's known as the resurrection chapter. And if you have a Bible, and you have it open to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That was written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. But at the top there in chapter 15, I would just write that. The resurrection uh, chapter of the Bible. Now, there is something that is wonderful that's going to happen to our bodies one of these days. Our Christian theology teaches us a very simple truth. And that is that when a believer dies, someone that knows the Lord, they've trusted Christ as their Savior, they consider themselves to be a Christian, they have asked forgiveness of their sins, what happens when that person dies? Well, they go immediately, their spirit does, to heaven. In fact, the Bible teaches us that very plainly in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. It says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Have you heard that before? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we take comfort in that as Christians in knowing when our loved ones die, we say they are now with the Lord. And that's partly true. Did you know that? It's partly true because their spirit then is with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now you probably have lost someone in this lifetime. I would say every person here has experienced death in your family to some degree. So what happens? Many times their body is in the cemetery, but their spirit is with the Lord. And that's where this whole thing begins, this, this kind of this Easter message. And I want you to think intently about this. The body goes and the body goes back to the grave. But that spirit that we have then goes to be with the Lord and rejoices face to face. Reminds me of a little boy who lost his grandmother. She had died. And the parents came in and told them that his beloved grandmother had passed away. And they said, but don't worry, she's in heaven. And the little boy found great joy in that, knowing that she was in heaven and she was with Jesus. So a few days later, they told this young man, they said, we're going to go down to the funeral home and we're going to visit grandma. And we're going to see grandma. So they take the little boy down to the funeral home and he walks in and there she is. Grandma is laid out and everyone is coming around and they're looking at her. And the little boy makes his way up to the casket and he looks at the casket and he looks at grandma. He turns around and he sees everybody dressed up in their nice clothes and their black clothes. And he turns back around and he looks at grandma and then he looks at his dad and he says, so this is heaven. A little bit discouraged. No, friend, that's not heaven. The body goes back to the earth. We call that the grave. Many of you will go and uh, pay tribute to your loved ones at the grave. There's a tombstone there maybe, a, a marker that identifies where perhaps some of their remains are. But make no mistake about it, 
Just as there was a resurrection of our Lord, there's going to be a resurrection for you as well. And many times during the Easter season, we forget that. And in fact, in our Christian theology, we forget that. We just think that's where our loved one's at. They're spirits with God, and that's all that's ever going to happen. Reminds me of a uh, story that I heard about. I heard about a man in England whose name was Solomon Pease. And he thought he would have a little fun once he died, and he put this on his tombstone. And he said, beneath this sod and beneath these trees lies the body of Solomon Pease. But this ain't Pease, it's just the pod. Pease shelled out and went home to God. And that's true. There's a lot of spiritual truth in that because our body, our physical body, is nothing more than just a, a pod. And the Bible refers to our physical bodies as an earthly house. It's a house that God allows us to live in physically for however long that we're here. But I want you to understand that one of the clearest teachings in all of Scripture is that there will be a resurrection of the body, your body. Now the Bible tells us one day that the graves are going to burst open. And this is where some of you say, wait a minute, I've never heard anything like this before. Well, I'm just telling you exactly what the Bible says. In fact, some people question the Apostle Paul about that. And in chapter 35 of verse, uh, uh, chapter, verse 35 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, here's the question that is asked of the Apostle Paul. They said this, but some men will say, and I want you to see this in your Bible, how are the dead raised? That's the question. It's the question they wanted to know from the Apostle Paul. How are those bodies going to be raised up? And with what body do they come? Now, do you understand the question that's being asked? These people see their loved ones go to the grave. They bury their loved ones. And then they ask the question, if our spirit is with God, what happens to our body if it goes back to the dust of the earth and God says that our Bodies are going to be raised. Now, I think that's a good question, don't you? I think it would be good for all of us to be able to figure that out today. And do you know why that is such a good question? Because if you are a Christian, that is your future. That means one day, if you don't go to be with the Lord in the rapture, one day you're going to die a physical death, your body's going to go to the grave, and your body is going to be resurrected from the grave. Now, many would look at that and they would say, well, I understand what you're saying, but doesn't that just seem a little bit scientifically impossible? Well, anybody with a thinking mind would say something like that. To have a resurrection of a human body once they have, have died? Well, I'm not talking about just Jesus. I'm talking about what happens to you. Friend, you have to understand something. We're not talking about science here. We're talking about Almighty God. And what God has said is going to happen. In the book of Acts, chapter 26, the Apostle Paul said this, and it goes with that question that was asked of him earlier, when they said, what happens to our bodies once they're in, in the ground? And in Acts chapter 26 and verse 8, make note of this verse, he said, why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? In other words, why would you even question that God can do something like that. Do you understand if you admit the fact of God, if you acknowledge the fact that there is a God, you will not have a problem with any of the miracles in the Bible. If you can wrap your head around the fact that Genesis 1-1 says, Billy Graham said this, in the beginning God created the heaven and earth. If you can wrap your mind around that and believe that, you will not have a problem believing anything else that the Bible actually teaches us. And so if God can make the heavens and earth out of nothing, certainly he can raise a human body out of something. Now that's an interesting thought. We die. We know people that have died. They're in the grave to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. So they're in heaven. How does all of this work out? Well, it would behoove us as Christians and believers to know exactly what's going on to happen because it does not all end at the grave. And there are some lessons that this Easter story and this Easter season teaches us about the resurrected body. Now, 
You don't have to raise your hand, but I'm almost certain today there are some people in here that never knew that one day their body was going to be resurrected. They thought that they was going, and I'm certain you've never heard an Easter message like this before, uh, that you're going to die one day, your spirit's with God, and your body goes to the grave, but one day that body's going to be resurrected? Well, how does that happen? Well, let me give you a couple things here, and then you'll have the message this morning. We have an illustration, and I want you to jot these five things down. Number one, it is illustrated by using an illustration of grain. That's the first point that you need to note because Paul says that in this passage here. Look at verse 36 in 1 Corinthians 15 of our text. If you follow me in this scripture, here's what you'll find. I'm not making up any of this. I'm not saying what I think is going to happen. I am just simply teaching you what the Bible says is going to happen to us when we die. And in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 36, it says this. He says, how foolish are you? Or thou fool, some would say. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Verse 37. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed. Perhaps of wheat or something else. So there's an illustration in those two verses that Paul gives us to that question, what happens to our body? And he says it's just like sowing wheat. Now, actually, he gives us a very vivid illustration in this passage. He says the resurrection of the body is like that of grain. You put it in the ground, and what happens when you put that seed in the ground? It dies, it rots, it decays, and then suddenly it fruitifies, and then it comes back to life. So do you see the illustration that Paul has given there for our bodies, what's going to happen to our bodies as well? Now, some of you are looking at me like you just don't like that analogy. You say, well, I don't know about that. And in fact, some may say that when grain goes into the ground, that it only appears to die. You put a seed in the ground and it just appears to die. Some would say, but there's a, there's a germ of life that stays in that seed. And others would say, but when you're dead, there is no life. You're really dead. If you've ever been to a funeral service, you know that it appears there's no life in that body at all. Can we agree on that? You can yell, you can cry, you can scream, you can plead, but that body is dead, and that body appears to be dead, and that body is not going to respond to you. Is that body dead? The answer to that is wrong. Now, that challenges everything you've probably ever thought about in your life because there is a part of the body that never dies. And this is what is so interesting. There is a spiritual nature within us that never dies. You say, now wait a minute, our spirit is with God. The body is in the grave. The body goes back to the dust of the earth. But there's a spiritual nature within all of us that never dies. Mark this down in John's Gospel, chapter 11 and verse 26. Jesus made this statement. He said, he that believeth in me shall never, what? Die. Now that's Jesus that said that. Don't take my word for it. He said when you believe in him, there's a spiritual nature in you that never dies. Your ever living spirit inside of you cannot die. And that spirit is that which your resurrected body will be raised up around. Now your head should really be spinning at this point. I mean, you waited all year to come to church today to hear a nice, simple message, and you get this. What am I thinking, right? Here's why we have a problem with this. Let me give you the illustration. You have a man that is born in Florence, Kentucky. That man gets older and decides he wants to work out west, so he goes out west and he works, and while he's there, he gets injured in an accident and he loses an arm. What do they do with that arm? bury it in the ground or burn it or something like that, right? Cremate it. And so now that arm is out west. That man decides later on in his life he wants to retire, and so he moves to Florida. And while he's there, he gets in an accident, and his leg gets cut off. What do they do with that leg? They burn it. They bury it. Something. He's got an arm now out west. He's got a leg that's now in Florida. And so he decides, I've had a rough life. But I'm going to ask God what he can use me for. And so the man becomes a missionary and he goes to Africa. And so while the man is in Africa, 
the man dies. They place him and bury him under an apple tree. The apple tree's roots reach down and absorb that man and turns him into apples, and then you buy them at Kroger's, and then you eat them yourself. Now, the question you have to answer to understand everything I've said to you today is this. Where is that man? He's got an arm out west. He's got a leg in Florida. He's got a body in Africa. He, the nutrition came out and produced these apples, and everybody's eating these apples. Where is this man? How can God raise him from the dead? Isn't that an interesting thought? That's the stuff that keeps me up at night, by the way, thinking about stuff like that. But you shouldn't let that bother you. Because the body that you have right now is not the one that you had 10 years ago. Do you realize that? There's not a particle in your body that was here 10 years ago. You are adding particles and you are losing particles each and every day as far as your body is concerned. How many of you remember, I think it was back in the 70s, the Ohio River froze over and they said people drove across that thing. Did any of you remember that? You old enough to remember that? Well, if you go back to that spot maybe where you walked across the Ohio River or drove across the Ohio River, and I ask you the question, is the river still there? You would say, yes, it's still there. But do you realize not one drop of water that was there in the 70s is still there today? No. No. We are constantly changing. But there is a life principle that makes my body my body. There's a spiritual principle, a life principle, that makes your body your body. It's called DNA. Now, I know you didn't come for this on this Easter Sunday morning, but hang with me here. It's what makes you you. It's what makes me me. Now, let me give you an example of this. I want you to see this in Scripture. In Psalm 139 and verse 16, if you have no other verse marked in your Bible, I want you to mark this verse because it says this, thine eyes did see my substance. That means God knew the DNA. God knew who you were. God knew everything about you, yet being unperfect, and then notice this part, and in thy book all my members were written. You know why God can resurrect that guy that went to Africa and died? Because God has a book that has every member, every part of him in his book, and God can do what only God can do and bring all that back together at the resurrection. It says, which, is, uh, which in countenance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. God sees us even in our mother's womb. Even before we are even formed, God knows who we are. I want you to think about that deep, theological, profound truth that I just told you. Even before I was conceived, God had all of my members written in his book. Isn't that an amazing thought that God has done that? God knows the plan for you. God knows your DNA. God knows everything about you. So it is God who created you, and at the time of the resurrection, God knows every single part of you, and it is God that will raise you up, and God gives you at the resurrection a brand new body, yet in reality, it's the body that God has given me. Is anyone confused yet? Just raise your hand, because we got more. Don't worry, we're not done. And God illustrates all of that with grain with planting a piece of grain. Now listen to this. That grain of seed comes out of the ground. No particle in the old grain or in the new grain, and yet it's part of the old grain. Happy Easter. Chew on that over lunch and get that all figured out and come back next year. How about that? God uses grain to tell us what the resurrection is going to be like. Now, there's a second thing here, second word I want you to notice in our outline, and that's uniqueness. It's individualized with uniqueness. Now, don't get the idea that we're all just going to be a bunch of clones when we get resurrected, when that takes place. No. In verse 38, back in our text in 1 Corinthians 15, I want you to see this. 
but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. You know what that tells me? At the resurrection, I'm going to have a body. God knows all of my members. No matter what happens to me, no matter how tragic it could be, God can bring all that back and God gives me a body. At the resurrection, you will be you. I will be me. Do you realize that if, when we get to heaven, I will know that you are you because there are some characteristics you have here and I will recognize you immediately? In fact, Scripture tells us we will be known as we are. How can we do that if we're a spirit? Now go back to what I said. We die, our spirit goes to be with God, right? The body goes back to the ground. It decays. But God says, Paul teaches us, there's going to be a resurrection of that body. Now, how? Because there are things uniquely about you that I will recognize. God knows us. God has our members written in his book, and God's going to resurrect that body. Now, one more word here I want to give you. The third thing is perfection. So God illustrates this with grain. He tells us that we all are going to be unique. We'll be known as we are known. And by the way, that should give you comfort for those of you that have had family members that are Christians that have died to know that when you see them again, you'll see them again. You'll be able to know that that's exactly who they are. But thirdly, it is infused with perfection. Now, what am I talking about here? Well, we're talking about our resurrected body. Go to verse 42 of our text this morning. Paul says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. That's your body that goes to the grave. It's sown in corruption, but it's raised in incorruption. Verse 43, it's sown in dishonor, raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, raised in power. It is sown a natural body, that's what you have right now, and is raised a spiritual body. Circle those two words, spiritual body. And he says there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Now, some of you are probably thinking today, I don't want my body back. There's nothing about this that I would want. I mean, it is decaying. It is breaking down. There is nothing that I want. Well, verse 42 says it is sown in corruption and it is raised in incorruption. And by the way, folks, we are decaying every single day. We are dying every single day. It is sown, verse 44, a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now, follow me closely here. I need you to tune in and get the, the end of this so this all makes sense to you. It does not say a spirit body. Follow that. It says a spiritual body. Not a spirit body, a spiritual body that comes out of the grave. Now, there's no such thing as a spirit body. There is such a thing as a spiritual body. To say a spirit body would be like saying a square circle. It doesn't make sense. You can't have that. And in fact, Jesus said this in Luke 24, a spirit has not flesh and bones. So we know that. There's no question about that. But you will be raised with an actual body. But here's the thing. That body that comes out of the grave will be motivated by spiritual principles. Not by, by soulish principles, but by spiritual principles. It will be liberated. It will be different than anything you have ever seen. And so we will have perfection at that time. Now, there's a fourth word that I want to mention here, or a fourth thing. He gives us this illustration of grain. He says our resurrected body is going to be unique. Our resurrected body is going to be perfect, which none of us can even comprehend. But fourthly, it is identified with Jesus. Our resurrected body will be identified with Jesus. Now, look at verse 45. I want to show you this through verse 45 through 49. And give you this teaching just real quick. It says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Who was Adam? That was the first man that was created. He was made a living soul. The last Adam 
was made a quickening spirit. Who's the last Adam? That's Jesus. So you have two individuals in this passage. You have the first Adam, Adam, the human being. You have the second Adam, which is Jesus, verse 46. How be it that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual, verse 47. The first man is of the earth, earthly. Adam is of the earth. Adam is earthly. The second man is of the Lord from heaven. That's Jesus. That's who we're talking about. Verse 48, and as is earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as is heavenly, such are they also which are heavenly. Now notice verse 49. Underline this entire verse because he says this, and as we have borne the image of the earthly, who's the earthly? Adam. What image do you and I bear? We bear Adam's image because we are sinners. But then he says, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, what did Paul just tell us? Even though we bear the image of Adam, a sinful man, at the resurrection, we're going to bear the image of Jesus Christ himself. Now, that's hard for us to imagine. Do you ever look in the mirror and think of, to yourself, I remind myself of Jesus? I look like Jesus, I act like Jesus, I talk like Jesus. Most of us don't say that. And so right now we have Adam's image. But one day we're going to have the image of Jesus. Now think about this. That happens at the resurrection. You will leave this body like Adam and you will be like Jesus bearing his image for the very first time. Now why do we struggle with that? We struggle with that because of this one word, and that word is sin. We struggle with that because we bear Adam's image. You and I have never seen a man like Adam, a man that was created perfect, a man that was created whole, a man at that time that had no sin. You and I know nothing about that because all we know is our sinful nature. Verse 44 says, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. Now follow close here. Again, he doesn't say spirit body, he says spiritual body. That's interesting to think about. And so you and I are identified with Jesus, we actually are made or created or raised in the resurrection to be in the image of Christ. I want to share a passage with you found in Luke's gospel in Luke 24, a couple verses here. After the resurrection of Jesus, do you realize he was not a ghost? Some people say that, that Jesus was a ghost. Jesus wasn't a ghost. Jesus had a real body, and here's how we know that. In Luke 24, 36, and as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, peace be unto you. Now, he had that resurrected body, right? But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Now this is interesting. And he said unto them, why are you troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, touch me, he says. See, for a spirit, he says, hath not flesh and blood. Now, that probably wrecks all of your theology when you think about that because your spirit is with God, the body goes back to the dust of the earth, but you're going to be raised up in the image and likeness of Christ. You went to the grave in the image and the likeness of Adam because of sin, but you're going to be raised in the likeness of Christ. Verse 40, and when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Do you realize at that time Jesus could be touched? He ate, he fellowshiped. Friends, your body goes to the grave, but resurrection morning when it comes, that body wakes up and that body becomes perfect and whole, just like Jesus. Now there's one final thing that I want us to see in this passage before we go today, and that is victory. Paul gives an illustration of grain. He says your body's unique. He says it's perfect. 
<clears throat> he says, you're going to be identified with Jesus. And then he says, it is immortalized with victory. Verse 51 of our text. He said, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What does he mean? Not everybody's going to die. But if you do not die and go to the grave and Jesus returns, it says the grave, those in the grave are going to go first and they get their resurrected body that is just like Jesus. And those that are here, scripture tells us, we are changed in the twinkling of an eye. Verse 52, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, Corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immorality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. If you hear nothing else today, I want you to hear that last phrase, death is swallowed up in victory. This is the reason if you are a Christian, you do not have to fear death. Now, can we be honest? I am not looking forward to the process, no matter what the process may be. I'm not looking forward to that, but I don't have to fear death itself. Paul goes on to say, death, <clears throat> where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? Now, the sting of death is sin. And sin hurts us. Sin affects us. We were created in sin. David said he was formed in sin. But here's the good news. The resurrection is coming. We become immortal. We are sinners, and that's why we die. But because of the first Easter morning, Jesus took the sting of sin from us all. And sin has no victory over any of us. When someone says to you, I'm going to get a new body, that's exactly what they mean as a Christian. The day is coming when they're going to get a new body. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't have to understand all of it, but I truly believe that if God can raise Jesus from the dead, that he can take this old body and he can make something great out of this old body. That is the message of Easter. It's a message of victory. If you don't know the Lord today, I would encourage you to get to know him because one day when Jesus returns, he's not taking everybody with him. He's taking those that are Christians with him. And I would, I would encourage you today to think about your relationship with God so when that day comes, you can have that resurrected body that's perfect like Christ. Would you do that?